Good morning. Good to see you guys here this morning. Thank you so much for coming to worship with us this morning. If you're new with us, uh, my name is Jonathan. I get the honor and privilege to serve here as pastor, and we're so thankful that you're here to worship with us this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. It's a great day to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. If you are visiting with us today, um, there is a connect card in the chair in front of you, and we'd love for you to take that and fill it out and place it in the offer plate when it comes by here in just a little bit. Um, we are we would love just to connect with you, know how we can be praying for you and your family, whatever, however we can serve you. We would love to know um, there in that connect card there if you take that and fill it out. Um, a couple of announcements, just a reminder, this coming Wednesday is our quarterly business meeting. Uh, so we'll be right here in the room on uh, this Wednesday evening at 630 uh, so come and, and see everything that's been going on this last couple, this last quarter here, financial report. Uh, but we'd love to have you come here this Wednesday night. Our youth will meet. We'll have some stuff for the kids so parents you can come and, and be a part of it as well. Um, but we're thankful for everything that God is doing. Our youth fundraiser board is still out there in the lobby, so make sure you uh, make note of that. And if you're able to give and help our kids go to camp, camp is coming up quick. VBS is coming up quick. Um, at WMU, our, our, our Operation Christmas Child boxes are out there, so please make note of all those things. Um, we're thankful that you're here today. Um, you have a, we have a special treat today. Um, many of you know him. He's been here a couple times uh, before, but Brother Daniel Ritchie and his family is here today. Uh, we're so thankful for him and for them coming down. Um, I've known Daniel and his family now for um, six, seven, eight years or something now, and uh, God brought us and our families together at a time that Katie and I needed um, someone like them in our life to be able to pour into us and help us heal through some difficulties we were facing. And Daniel is a phenomenal man um, and just a phenomenal family. And so you will be blessed today. I know it. Um, he is a speaker and an author. He speaks all across the country um, and is a sought after speaker, as an author. I've got two of his, I got his books that he's written. I encourage you to get both of them, uh, My Affliction for His Glory and um, Endure. Um, both of them, you can get both of them on Amazon and um, anyway, where books are sold, but uh, I encourage you, you will be blessed if you take those and take the opportunity to get those. Uh, but we're thankful that he's here. Um, I'm, I'm introducing him now so that after the special, he's going to come up and just, and we're going to let him loose. And uh, so I pray that uh, God is moving, is, you're ready for what God has for you today through, through Brother Daniel and his family. We're so thankful that he's here. Glad that you're here today. Um, it's a great day to be in the Lord's house. So let me pray for us and we'll jump right in and get started this morning. Father, you are so good, and we're so thankful to be able to gather in this house today, Lord. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this beautiful weather you've given us today to come and just worship you, Lord, to be reminded of your goodness and your grace and your mercy, Lord. Father, I pray in this moment, Lord, for this worship, Lord, for this time where we just come and we lift our voices to you, Lord, lift our hearts to you, Father, to prepare us for the word that you've given Brother Daniel. Lord, I thank you for him and his ministry that you blessed him with, Lord. Lord, he's a great friend, but he's also a great brother in Christ, Lord. And Father, I pray that you bless him and his family, Lord, as they minister to you, minister to congregations all across this country, Lord. And Father, I thank you for the gift that you've given him, Lord, and just the passion to share the gospel, Lord. And Father, I pray for the message that he will give today, Lord. I, Father, I pray that you will speak to him, speak through to him, to us through him, Lord. And Father, I thank you for this time, Lord. Be with us now as we worship you, Lord. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Go ahead and stand with us as we enter our worship this morning. I just want to say this about this first song. I was watching a clip uh, a couple weeks ago. I don't remember how when this actual interview was from, but John MacArthur was on Larry King. I don't know. It's probably 10 or 12 years ago whenever he was on. He was on there, I think, with a rabbi and maybe a... I'm not exactly sure who else he was on there with. Jonathan probably tell you. But they were comparing different religions. And one of the points that they came to was that out of religion, Larry King came to the conclusion that we needed justice. We needed justice. And John MacArthur said, no, let me tell you, the last thing we need is justice. Justice would not be good. We don't want fairness because that puts us in a very bad spot. We need mercy. We need God's mercy and grace in our lives. And that's what this song is about. It hit me like a, just like a slap in the face of that if God had his justice and fairness came in my life, I would be in a very bad place. I need God's grace and his mercy because I can't live up to what Christ is. And neither can any of you, by the chance. Neither can any of us. That's what this first song is all about. So sing with us. His mercy is more. What love could remember 
Now my soul cries out, I'm 
this last part with us. See the stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. special and the message. Thank you everybody for coming out. If you will, bow your heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and we thank you that everybody can make it here safely and we have and we pray that everybody will have a good day. Amen.
set the stage for you this morning. Jesus had died on a cross. His disciples had scattered. Two of them had taken a road to Emmaus. And on that road they met a man that they didn't recognize. And oh, what a man. Bible tells us sometimes we entertain angels unaware. Have you ever had a time in your life that you met someone and after they were gone, you just had a feeling that was something different about what happened. Can you imagine how these boys must have felt when they realized who they had met on that road? Heads were low, steps were slow. Brother, start again. I missed the intro altogether. The heads were low, the steps were slow. As they walked along that long Emmaus road, then a man appeared, and as he drew near, he said, Why are you so sad? Are things really that bad? They said, Sir. Have you not heard? You must be a stranger in this time. Cause the one who came in the Father's name, he has been cut down. They laid his body in the ground. As they walked and talked, he began to explain about this Jesus and why he came. He opened the scriptures and began to teach the preacher of preachers. He began to preach. In the wilderness, the children had nothing there to eat. But manna from heaven fell down at the feet, but they were dry and thirsty. In a foreign land Living water came forth Out of a rock in the sand When the three Hebrew children Were thrown in the flames A fourth man appeared They even called him by name The man, the water, the man They're all the same If you're still confused Then let me say this real plain It was me it was me. I'm the one you left back there at Calvary. Who do you think hung the stars in the sky? Who do you think made the day and the night? Who made the flowers? Who made the trees? Who made the sun and the moon and the seas? Who gives life to all that believe? Who do you think made the blind to see? Who made the very air that you breathe? Who defeated death and won the victory? It was me. It was me. It was me. I'm the one who died for you on Calvary. It was me who loved you when no one else would, who saved you when no one else could. It was me. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, good morning, KMBC. How are we doing? Good, man. Listen, it is uh, it is an honor to be back with y'all. I think I think the last time I, I hung out with uh, KMBC folks, it was probably seven years ago um, for a, uh, a youth ministry fall retreat. And it's kind of funny now because now the youth are not uh, youth. Uh, y'all are like grown and married and have beards. It's kind of. It's kind of weird, um, but uh, but hey, it's a good thing you didn't you didn't stay the same, man. Uh, it's good to see so many of y'all having having grown up and God's working and moving uh, in and through your lives, man. It's good to be back with Jonathan. I think I think the last time Jonathan and I had man to man time, it was at this rib place in St. Louis. John, you know, Jonathan was there uh, serving in ministry. I was cutting through town. I was I was flying back home out of the St. Louis airport, and so we ate ribs to the glory of God. And now. <laughs> Now, now I'm kind of sad I don't have a rib buddy in, in St. Louis. Like, I'm going to have to eat ribs by myself, which, when you're armless, is complicated. So, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss that, my man. But, uh, man, it's, it's good, to, good to see the Sheelers here in, uh, in Kinley. Uh, man, good to be back with y'all. Listen, if you have your Bibles, turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. Um, we're going to look Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Uh, here in a moment. And now listen, I know, I know some of y'all, it's like we, we have interacted before. Y'all, y'all, y'all know the whole armless deal. Uh, some of y'all don't. Like some of y'all are looking at me going, what, what happened to his arms? Um, you know, because that, that is a very natural uh, reaction that, that I get from folks a lot. People, um, people have a lot of curiosity. And I mean, chief of which is usually people look at my whole situation. The first, the first thing they want to know is like, how did I get in, in this whole situation in the first place? Because a lot of people think that it's a wild animal um, that, that brought me to the point where I am. And I'm like, y'all got some vivid imaginations. Um, but, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people think it's a shark, which, you know, the soul surfer girl, like I, I totally understand the assumption. Um, other people, they, they take it in a, in a wild direction. Like a few years ago, I'm on a, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm flying back home to Charlotte where uh, the family and I were living at the time. Uh, I was in Denver, Colorado. And so I was, I, was, I was boarding this plane to Charlotte and I'm getting on. And now listen, like, y'all, it's kind of crazy. A lot of people would think uh, a preacher is an extrovert and loves people. Um, you know, I have a complicated relationship with people, man. Like I'm a... I'm an introvert. I, w- I will say this. Because of the work of Christ, I love people. I just don't like people. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's, the, sort of, that's the sort of person I am. And so, like, a lot of times when I fly, just to, just to cut down on, like, the small talk and stuff like that, I'll wear noise-canceling headphones. So it's just like I can, I can keep my head down, do my thing. And so I had my noise-canceling headphones on. I'm listening to, to a podcast or whatever. And as I'm getting on the plane, there's this guy that as we're boarding, he's just like staring at my very empty sleeve like the whole time we're boarding. It wasn't like a passing glance sort of deal. It was like burn a hole in my soul, like staring, <laughs> staring at my empty sleeve. And, um, and so like, y'all, again, I'm, I, I try to love people, but sarcasm is my native language. English is, is my second language. And so I just get sick and tired of my dude staring at me, and so I, I slide my headphone off of one of my ears, and I'm going to give my dude a, a piece of my mind, uh, shall we say. And, uh, and as soon as I slid it off my ear, he took it as his green light that now he's going to chat me up, and the first words out of his mouth was, was it a bear? And I'm, and I'm like, there's, there's no way in the world my man is this dumb. Like, it's, it's impossible. And so... I, I thought I'd like let him off the hook. Like if I ask him a question, he'll realize how dumb he is, and then we don't have to have this conversation. And uh, and so I look at him and I go, "Was was it was it a what?" And he goes, "A bear. The arms. Was it a bear?" And I was like, "Okay, we're gonna do this." And, and so I, I'm I'm a super visual guy, and so I thought I'll, I'll paint a picture for my guy. And I'm like, "Bro, is this like when we're at church on Sunday?" You know. You're sitting there, you're, you're getting through the majority of the sermon, but it's like that 30-minute sermon from Jonathan turns into that 55-minute sermon. You know, he's channeling his inner Matt Chandler, and, uh, and it's like, you know, you're sitting there, and your tummy starts to growl. You're like, you're getting really, really hungry, and so you start to daydream about what Sunday lunch is going to be, and it's like, you know that you know that there is one thing 
that's going to fulfill your Sunday hunger, and it is fried chicken to the glory of God. And it's not, and it's not just like chicken thigh or chicken breast, like you want some good old-fashioned like fried chicken legs. You know that that's the only thing that can fulfill your hunger. And I look at this guy, and I'm like, my dude, are you telling me some bear somewhere woke up in some cave? His little bear tummy started to growl, and he thought, you know what? There's one thing that's going to fulfill my hunger. And... <laughs> It is some good old-fashioned people arms. Like, I don't, I don't want the rest of them. I just want the, the yummy, gummy arms. Like, that's the only thing I want. You're telling me I met the pickiest bear in the woods and he only touched my arms. And, uh, and it was like, it, it, at this moment, my guy knew he messed up, you know? And, uh, and he looked at me and he was like, no. And I'm like, that's right, you moron, no. And, uh, you know, the moment, the moment the word moron left my mouth, I was like, this is not... This is not a great moment. And, uh, and so we get on the plane, and I, you know, in this three and a half hour flight, I'm just like, man, when we land in Charlotte, I want to find this guy. I want to apologize for calling him a moron. And, um, and so we land in Charlotte, and, and everybody gets up to get their luggage. I'm in the back, like, no lie. I am, I'm literally last row of the plane by the bathrooms, and I pop up to try to find this dude. I'm looking over everybody. He's in, the, he's in first class. He's second row of the plane. And I'm like, great, like, he's going he's gonna to get off this plane probably 15 minutes before me. And so, you know, he, the time comes to get off the plane. He gets off. I wait forever. I get off. And as soon as I get off the plane, I just start sprinting as hard as I possibly could. Like, I'm running through this airport. And it's like, I see him coming from far off, and I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm going to be able to have a conversation with this man. But then it's like, panic hits me, because I'm like, how do, how do I get somebody's attention that I don't know their name? Because it's like, you guys with your handy-dandy pointer fingers, you know, you come up behind somebody that you don't know, and you tap them on the shoulder with your pointer finger and be like, excuse me, you know, they'll, they'll turn around, they'll have a conversation with you. Um, I can't do that. And, um, and so I'm coming up behind this guy, and we are literally just about to leave the airport. And, um, and so I'm like, I've got to get his attention. And so the, the only thing I could think of doing was as gently as you could headbutt another human being. I sort of I sort of buddy bumped my guy on the shoulder. And he, in fairness to him, he took great offense to being headbutted at the airport. And so he whirls around. And I mean, just like a snap reaction, he's got his fist balled up like he's going to punch me in the face. Y'all, humor is my greatest weapon. Like, I am not much of a fighter, but I can make people laugh. And so I'm like, I've got to get a one-liner right now that's going to save my life. And, uh, and so I look at this dude, and I'm like, don't, don't hit me. I'm unarmed. And, uh, and you know, he, uh, he, he sort of he, he, he drops the hands, and, and like, the, the, the fists become unballed. And, uh, and he doesn't punch me in the face. And so I'm like, all right, this is my, this is my chance. This is my window. And, uh, and I was like, bro, listen, I am... I'm super sorry that I called you a moron, and, uh, and he's like, I'm, I'm super sorry that I thought a bear ate your arms, you know, we had this little, we had this little back and forth, but then it's like, you know, then, then he wanted to know the, the real story, he's like, all right, so what a bear, um, you know, how did you lose your arms? And I was like, oh, I was, just, you know, I was just born this way, you know, I'm, I'm, this is all I've known my whole life, and so he's like, oh, huh interesting. So he's like, how do you, how do you like do stuff? And I was like, well, I, I do everything with my feet. He's like, everything. And I'm like, everything? And, uh, and he's like, so you write with your feet? I'm like, uh-huh. He's like, eat? Yep. You drive? Yep. You mow the lawn? Yep. You know, it's like we literally, we go through this laundry list of questions for probably 10 minutes and we get to the, to the end of all of his armless questions. And he looks at me and he's like, man, you've you've like been through some stuff in your life. Like you, you've, you've been through a lot of hurt, a lot of heartache, a lot of trial. Like how did you, how'd you get through this? And, then, and it was then, man, this dude just left the door wide open for me. Like I'm, I'm not going to give him the overly motivational speech of just like, you know, try hard and you know, you can do anything in life. Like that's not, that's not who I am. That's not what I'm about, man. I get to I stand there in the middle of Charlotte Douglas International Airport, and I get to tell him about how not only God in his grace, man, made me to, to withstand just life without arms, but how God in his grace saved me and gave me hope and strength and peace in the midst of my mess, and that that reality can, can be true for him as much as it was for me to, like, to, to know and understand 
that the gospel of God's grace not only saves us from our sins, but it gives us peace and purpose and confidence for us to walk through in the rest of the life that God in his kindness gives us. And and y'all, I can't, like I, I sit here now, I mean, Gosh, the, the God in his kindness, he saved me as a 15-year-old. So now I'm, I'm 23 years in, in this amazing relationship with Jesus, 22 years in, in ministry. And I can't help but think that moment right there with that man in that airport, God had in mind when he fearfully and wonderfully made me in my mother's womb 38 years ago without arms. God very intentionally made me with this packaging so that man would think a bear ate my arms so we could have a really awkward conversation that leads to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like y'all, there there are so many times in our life when we look at our story, we look at our giftedness, we look at the things that we've been through, and we feel like we're the biggest mistake in the world. We feel like we don't bring a lot to the table We feel like that, man, if I was only like somebody else in my life, like how many times do we compare ourselves to other people and think if I had their gifts or if I had their family or their background or or this or that or the other, if I had what they had, then I could do great things for the Lord. But I'm just me. Y'all, what we're going to see here in Jeremiah chapter one is God wants just you. God didn't, God didn't form and fashion somebody else in your mother's womb. God formed and fashioned you not only for, for you to enjoy this life that he has given you, but for you to live out the purpose that he's called you to. So look with me, Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to read verses 4 through 10 this morning. And now listen, it's, it's such, a, such an interesting like, background as, as we get ready to read this because Jeremiah Jeremiah's a preacher's kid um, for all intents and purposes. Like Jeremiah's daddy uh, was a Levite, so he was, he was an Old Testament priest. Jeremiah had grown up around the church, around the law, around like all things religious. And at this point, Jeremiah is probably somewhere between the ages of, of 16 and 20. So he's not like especially young, but he's not exactly a guy as we're about to see here. He's not exactly the guy that we would think would would fit into ideal national leadership to call an entire country back to repentance. But as we're about to see here, this is exactly what the Lord intends, and this is exactly what the Lord meant, even when he made Jeremiah in his mother's womb. So read with me, Jeremiah chapter 1. Verses 4 through 10. Now the, the, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you and I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, Ah, oh Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak. I am just a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth. For all, to all to whom I send you, you shall go. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand, he touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build, and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Let's, let's pray. God, I just pray in these few moments as we look at this call that you have put on the life of Jeremiah, Father, may we also see that this isn't a truth and a reality just for this Old Testament prophet, but God, that this is the picture that you have for each and every one of us, that you have made, that you have saved, and that you have called to go and carry your word and your gospel into the world. Father, this morning, may, may we see ourselves as your masterpiece. God, may we see our lives is an opportunity to worship you. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, if you are taking notes this morning, um, man, there's three, just three overarching truths that I want us to see from Jeremiah chapter one. And the first thing is this, is that you were made with both love and a mission. You were made with both love and and a mission. As you see this first part now, now again, listen, like y'all, I am, 
I'm the guy that always likes to paint the picture of what is going on, especially when we see like narrative, like we see here in Jeremiah chapter one, or like you see in the gospels. I always love to just paint the picture of what is going on to set the stage. And I mean, to imagine you're just a teenager and all of a sudden the creator and sustainer of the universe has an audible conversation with you. And the first words out of his mouth, look in verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That statement right there, God is saying, listen, I am not a distant God. I am not a God who just accidentally, like your story and my story, just collided. God is saying right here, I am intimately involved with you and your life and who you are. And that started even before I made you in your mother's womb. Like we see this picture, like God's understanding of who we are more often than not, not only shows us that, that he is active and he is involved and he is working, but y'all, God, God's intimate understanding of us shows us how much he loves us. Like this, this is the, the most important being in all of creation. And yet he looks at you, he looks at me, And he wants to be intimately involved with every part of our life. You know, one of the most one of the most beautiful pictures of the creation of man we see in Psalm 139. You know, it's it's a text we've heard over and over where the psalmist says, God, you fearfully and wonderfully made me. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You formed my innermost parts. I will praise you for wonderful are your works. But that entire chapter, like if, if you go back home this afternoon and you read the entire chapter of Psalm 139, it's not just this picture of God making us. It's this picture that God is intimately involved wherever we are in life. Like Psalm 139 says, God, listen, if I am in the deepest depths, you are there. If I am on the highest mountain, you are there. God, there is nowhere I can go. There is nothing I can do that you don't know about and you're not involved in. God wants you to know that you know that you know that he loves you. He's not distant from you. He hasn't forgotten you. You're not an afterthought. Like he sees you as a masterpiece and a vessel of his glory and grace. So don't sit in this room this morning and just think that, man, because of my circumstances, God has distanced himself from me or because of my mistakes, or because of my sins, or because of my failures, or because of my insecurities. He doesn't love me, and he has no purpose for me. Y'all, the the reality is this. He hasn't gone anywhere. He hasn't left you. He hasn't forsaken you. God's plan that he began in your mother's womb is God's plan that he desires to see through to the end when you pass from this life to the next. God deeply, deeply loves you. But the second thing is this, is not only does he love you, but he has a purpose for you. Again, look, look in verse five, when when after he talks about that, listen, before I formed you, I knew you, but I love this statement. Before you were born, I consecrated you and I appointed you a prophet to the nations. I love this picture that before Jeremiah had a name, Jeremiah had a mission. Like before his mommy and daddy even knew he was there, God goes, this is my prophet. This is my man that I want to use to call Israel back to repentance. This is a forerunner of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to use him to change a country and to change a planet. Y'all, as much as this is true for Jeremiah, it is true for you and I. When God forms and fashions you in your mother's womb, he has your mission that you can walk in right now in his mind. Like there's some of us in here, we feel like, hey, I'm not an extrovert or I can't lead a small group or I can't get up and preach a sermon or or, or sing in in a praise team. Then I don't have any godly good that I can do in the world. And y'all, that's just simply not true. That's a, that, that is, that is a, a bold-faced lie of the enemy that God made a mistake when he made you. Because the same is true of Jeremiah, that God made Jeremiah with a purpose and with his mission in mind. God made you with a purpose and with his mission in mind. And it might not be, you may never preach a sermon. You may never lead a small group. You may never go to a far-flung African country and build schools and talk about Jesus in an African village that you can't even pronounce the name of. But what God made you and formed you in your mother's womb with the mission in mind is to love people well that you work with, 
to be the picture of Jesus to a family member that is the most unlovable person that you've ever met or interacted with. God has placed you with your gifts and abilities in the midst of your family, in the midst of this community, to just leverage your everyday life to show the world Jesus and to tell the world about Jesus. Y'all, he didn't, he didn't mess up when he made you. Like, we can use where God has planted us right here, right now, for his glory. Because a lot of times we use our circumstances as excuses. I mean, same for me. It's like, I look at the whole armless situation and I'm thinking, you know, if God wanted to use me for his glory, he would make me like six foot eight and 250 pounds like LeBron James. And I could like dunk on people to the glory of God, you know, like that's, that's cool. You know, these days I go outside on a breezy spring day and my sleeves start flapping in the wind and I look like one of those inflatable things outside a used car dealership, you know, and it's like, (laughs) this is, there's not, there's not a lot glorious about that. Like it's, it's kind of weird, but to realize like God knew exactly what he was doing. Like I would, I wouldn't be in this pulpit if I was just like, a normal, bald-bearded, armed preacher. You know, Jonathan can pick from a lot, of, a lot of better preachers with arms, but he's like, you know what? You're the best armless preacher I know, so why don't you, why don't you come hang out? You know, God, God knew what he was doing, even with the giftedness of my story and my disability, to point others to, to God's grace and God's comfort and God's power, even in our weakness. Like even the worst parts of your story that God has redeemed are parts of the story of your life that he can use for his glory. Because y'all, the second thing I I want us to see is this, is not only did God make us with love, God made us with a mission, but God has also given us that mission without excuse. God has given you a mission without excuse. Now again, let's kind of rewind. Let's put ourselves in Jeremiah's shoes. He's sitting there talking to the creator and sustainer of the universe. God is telling him, bro, you are going to be my guy that changes the planet. And what are the first words out of Jeremiah's mouth? As he looks at at an all-powerful, almighty God. God, I'm not cut out for this. I'm just a kid. I'm too young. I don't know what to say. I'm not your guy. Who in the world told him that? Who in the world looked at Jeremiah and said, you know what, you're too young for Jesus to use you. You, You're not smart enough to make an impact in the kingdom of God. I can tell you there's one person who who, who said that, and that's Satan himself. Man, he he has operated in, in lying to take away from the glory of God since Genesis chapter 3. I mean, he slithers on the scene in Genesis chapter 3. What are the first words out of the serpent's mouth? Did God really say? Did God really say that you shouldn't eat of that tree? But just as much, he's going to slither up into your life and he's going to say, did God really give you a purpose? Does God really love you? Do you really think you can do any earthly good in this broken and busted up world? Did God really say? Y'all, when we look at the excuses in our life as to why God can't use us, usually there are two things in view right there. It is we're focusing on the lies of the enemy and we have too small a picture of who God is. Because y'all, here's the thing about God. Like we, we have... We have this really weird perspective of who God is because like we fully believe that, I, I, I mean, I would say for the majority of us in here, like if you're sitting in a, in a church in Kinley, North Carolina on a Sunday morning, most of us are like, okay, Jesus loves me. Jesus can save me. Jesus can give me the strength to get through Monday tomorrow. We, we have this picture of God's grace and God's provision very clearly in view. But then when it comes to God calling you to serve in the youth ministry here, or God calling you to be a deacon, or God calling you to share Jesus with that ornery neighbor that you live beside, that's the first time where we go, oh, no, God, I don't know about that. Like, God, I'm not a people person. God, I'm not this. I'm not that. We have this amazingly small view of God when it comes to his mission. And y'all, if he saved you, he can send you. If he rescued and redeemed you, if he called you from death to spiritual life, why can't he call you to go and love your unlovable neighbor? 
or to deal with your very picky coworker, or to just be the light of Christ to people who desperately need what you have. And it's just like, y'all, the, the, the list of excuses that we can go through in Scripture are incredibly long. Jeremiah here, he's sitting here and he's going, God, I'm too young, man. You know, we, we got a whole front row up here of, uh, you know, younger-ish folks. So way, way to be there. Appreciate y'all. And, and there's one thing that I want you guys to, to know that you know that you know. You, you don't have to get a high school diploma for Jesus to use you. You don't have to get a college degree for Jesus to use you. You don't, you don't have to wait till you're married. You don't have to wait till, till you have kids. Like God can use you right now at whatever school you're at. I mean, to show the world the love and the purpose and the grace of God, you don't have to wait around for some moment on your calendar or for some milestone moment to happen. Just as much as that's true of Jeremiah, that God will give you the words to say, God will give you all the words to say. But then just as much like, Y'all, as, as much as youthfulness is an excuse as to why God can't use you, I think also we think advanced age is a reason why God can't use us. How many times do we say, God, I'm too old, my best days are behind me, like, God, I'm playing on the back nine, not the front nine, like, this is not, this, this, is, this is not my spot, this is, this is not what, I, what I'm going to do, do an abundantly good job of, let me try to fix this mic as it jumps off my ear, Oop. This is what happens when you have a big head and no arms. That's uh, uh, But, uh, you know, for, for some of us in here, we think that we're be- because we're too advanced in age that Jesus can't use us. That's the same excuse that Abraham held up to God when God looked at him and said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And Abraham's sitting here going, Lord, I'm really old and I have no kids. I don't see how this is going to happen at all. But yet every step along the way, as God called, Abraham went, Abraham obeyed, Abraham didn't knew, know what in the world he was doing. But even in the midst of the obedience that Abraham walked in, he became the forerunner of a great and mighty nation, even though he's really, really old. There's some of y'all in here, you think that, man, because I'm in my 60s, my 70s, my 80s, that God can't use me. Again, that's a lie of the enemy. Like you, you have wisdom to share. You have love. You have time. You have opportunity. Man, for us to just put our yes on the table before the Lord and say, God, here's my life. I might only have a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade left, but I'm going I'm to leverage it for your glory, realizing that one day, And maybe a day really soon, I'm going to see you face to face. And I want to see you face to face with the words coming out of his mouth. Well done. You finished well. You didn't limp to the finish line. You made the most of the days and the weeks that I gave you for my glory. Y'all, and just just as Moses... As God calls Moses from a burning bush, again, here's this picture, the miraculous calling of God that God shows up in this big way. He says, listen, I want you to lead my people into freedom. I want you to lead them into the promised land. And what is the first words out of Moses' mouth? Lord, listen, I'm not much of a talker. Like, I, you know, I got, I got this whole speech impediment thing. Like, I'm, I'm not a gifted speaker. I'm not a gifted leader. I'm not your guy. And how many of us look at the Lord when he calls us and we go, God, I'm not a people person. God, I'm really busy. God, I don't have the talents or the gifts or the abilities or the influence that these people have. Y'all, that excuse that we hold up before the Lord, it's just a small-minded picture of who we really think God is in light of the lies of the enemy. And so, y'all, for for whatever excuse you want to hold up to the Lord as to why he can't use you, man, I want you to combat the lies of the enemy with the words of the Lord himself. We see this with Paul. Like, y'all, when you look at the story of Paul, before he's saved, Paul is a horrible human being. Paul is self-righteous. He's the most religious person in the room. He's an accessory to murder. He's a persecutor of the church. Paul was a deplorable person before he came to Christ. And that's the one thing that people wanted to lob at him and say, you have no business planning churches and sharing the gospel with the Gentiles because you were a terrible person. But look what Paul says about his whole past in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, listen, I'm, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Listen to this, though. But by the grace of God, 
I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Like Paul is painting this picture that, listen, you might be the worst person in this room right now, but the grace of God is bigger than your past. The blood of Christ covers all your insecurities, all your iniquities, all your shame, all your sin, all your failures. And and for us in Christ to hang our entire identity and hope and purpose on that and that alone. As Paul says, it's by the grace of God that I've arrived at that place and it's by the grace of God that I'm going to tell the world about him. Even the apostle of apostles, the original church planner, the apostle Paul had to fight off the lies of the enemy with the word of God. And I would challenge you to do just as much the same. Third thing I want us to see is this. is It's the reality. You were made to go and tell. You were made to go and tell. Look at these last few verses, verses 8 through 10. First, God paints this picture for Jeremiah. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to give you my words. I'm going to place them in your mouth. But look in verse 10. God paints the picture of just what a weighty thing and a weighty message that he's going he's gonna to carry. Because look at, look at the first four verbs that, that, that God lays out for Jeremiah that he's going to have to share. He says, listen, I'm, I'm going to have you pluck up, break down, destroy, and overthrow. The beginning part of the message that Jeremiah is going to have to carry is a weighty and a very difficult message. But I love those last two verbs that we see. But... You're also going to carry a message to build up and to plant. Y'all, the picture for us in Christ is that we are given a weighty message in the gospel. It is that for each and every one of us that have graced the face of this earth, we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that our sin separates us from a holy God. And so this creates this massive problem that a sinful man can have nothing to do with a holy God. And so there's a lot of weight. There there is an uncomfortable message when it comes to us coming to, to a world soaked in sin and to tell them that you've missed the mark. But the hope of the gospel is this, is that's not the end of the story. Amen. Jesus did what we couldn't. Jesus lived a perfect life that we could never live. Jesus died the death that we should die. God raises Jesus to life to show us that death is not the end of the story, that he's bigger than both sin and death. God raises Jesus to life for for us to see that 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 is the, the resurrection life that you and I walk in in Christ and that you and I walk to make that Savior known in everything that we do. That's the good news that we carry. And y'all, it's, it, there, there are times it, it is scary. There, there are times that that is weighty. Like y'all, I, I, I've preached for 22 years. I still get nervous every time I, I step into the pulpit. I am, I am not a, an overly like wordy dude. I, I, I don't have a whole lot of comfort like in, in crowds. And I think some of that, I've, I've spent my whole life being judged by people being stared at and pointed at and just the jerkish things that, that I have to deal with and, and go into crowds. So it's like, I think I've been conditioned to be wary of people. And so my, my whole ministry life has been this pushing back against that. Um, and God keeps putting me in these places where I'm like woefully insufficient for the task, where, where I'm in over my skis. Like y'all, a, a few years ago, um, there, was this, there was this big groundswell of abortion legislation going on in the country at the time. And, and up in the state of Virginia, basically they were looking to, to open up abortions for any discernible disability in utero from conception to birth. And even in a situation where the governor of Virginia described that, that a child who survived an abortion or a child that was born with a disability that they didn't catch, in his words, that 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 child could be kept comfortable and then a conversation could ensue between the doctor and the mother as to whether the baby should live or die. And and as I read through this article about this legislation, like y'all, that's my story in a nutshell. They didn't catch my disability in utero. I was born not breathing and the doctor asked my dad if they just wanted to let me go. And I'm so incredibly thankful that I had a dad that, that didn't go that route, but chose to have me revived. But I thought, man, how many more kids in the state of Virginia are going to be born like me and then just left to die because we don't have what you have? 
that we can't process like you can process. How many little lives that God has made in his image to display his glory. How many of those lives are going to get snuffed out because they're just not good enough? And, um, and, and y'all, I'm not, a, I'm not a political dude at all. Um, I'm, like, I'm like a Christ first, Christ in everything sort of guy. But I was just like, the, the world has made abortion political, but like life has been a God issue from Genesis chapter one on. And, and, and so for, for me, this is, this is a theology thing. This isn't a political thing. And, and so I just shot a video on my phone real quick, just talking about that the sanctity of human life is stamped on each and every one of us from the moment that God forms and fashions us in the womb. And disability or ability doesn't take away or add to that. So I'm a millennial, and so the only thing I could think of doing was put it on Twitter. And, uh, and so I posted it, posted it on Twitter. And, um, and I mean, again, as, as, as only the Lord can do in about four hours, this tweet gets viewed 60,000 times. Um, and, and by the end of the night, somebody from Fox News had sent me a DM, and they were like, hey, man, can you, we, we saw your video, can you turn this into an article, and we want to post it on our website tomorrow morning. And again, I'm not a political guy. And, and so I, I was just like, listen, I, I'd be happy to do this, but it's just like, I'm, I'm not going to talk politics. I'm going to talk like Jesus in life. Is that okay? And they're like, that's okay. And so I was like, okay. Um, and so I typed out this article. I sent it to them. They run it the next day. And, um, and, and when it goes on their website of all the things on the planet that Apple News used as their one push notification to every Apple device in the United States that day was that article about the sanctity of human life stamped on each and every one of us. Four and a half million people read this article by the end of the day. And, and that, that next morning, I went and preached in South Carolina at a, at a church, and I, and I got back into my car as I got done preaching, and I had five missed calls from a New York City area code and a bunch of voicemails. And so I listened to the voicemail, and it, it was Fox, and they wanted me, they, they, basically they were like, hey, can you be on a plane tonight and be in New York City tomorrow, because we want to do an interview with you on one of our shows? And part of me, like, again, I, I don't like people, um, like, you know, like, this is, this is something that it, that's definitely, like, this is a lot of people on, on, a, on a big scale, but, but for me to realize, too, this is my opportunity to defend both image bearers and the God that made those image bearers in the first place. And so I said, yeah, Heather and I scrambled. We had to go to like, because I'm not exactly like a classy dude that has a wardrobe of national television sort of shirts. And, uh, and so we went to good old Marshalls, y'all. And, uh, and, and I, bought a, I bought a Marshall shirt that I, that I took on a national news show. Um, but it, it was a good looking Marshall shirt. So I was, I was looking as stylish as a bald, bearded, armless man can look. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we, um, in leading up to this, like, just so y'all know, all these shows are scripted. Like, I knew my questions in advance. They knew my answers in advance. Um, so we had worked all that out. And so we get there, we do the interview. It, it all went to script until halfway through this interview. The, the woman that was interviewing me, Martha McCallum, she looked at me and she says, listen, something happened to you when you were 15 years old that changed your life. And I want you to share with everybody what that was. Y'all, I'm there to talk about abortion and sanctity of human life legislation. And this woman wants me to talk about the night that I trusted and arrested in Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. And for me, for the next 30 seconds, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with seven and a half million people. Y'all, I've preached for 22 years. If I preach for 42 more, I will not preach to seven million people. But in that moment, God said, just watch me work. I need you to trust me. I'll give you the words to say. I'll give you the opportunities. I just need you to walk in them. Now, now listen, like y'all, your, your moment for you to put your yes on the table before the Lord, it might not be a Fox News interview, but God will give you both the opportunity and the words to share the gospel with the people that, that you consider those that you love the most. And what are you going to do with that opportunity sitting right in front of you? Are we going to present our laundry list of excuses of why God can't use us? or to talk about how we're too busy, or to talk about how we're not cut out for this. You are cut out for this because God made you for this. 
God saved you for this. And all he's asking you to do is to be obedient to it. Whether that's in the little stuff, like I fully recognize that there are people in this room that God is calling to either full-time ministry or to missions. And, and, and I recognize that's a big thing. But there are some of us in here, God is calling us to be obedient in, in much smaller things. To take our gospel to our, our literal, physical neighbors. To share the gospel with the people that our kids go to school with. Share the gospel with coworkers. To just be the picture of a loving Savior who died for the people that hated him. That might be the call that Jesus has sat on your life. And so this morning, I just simply ask you, what does that look like? What does that look like in your life right now? How has God made you? How has God saved you? How has God gifted you to tell the world about him? And so some of us, some of us this morning, just very simply, we need to just say, all right, God, here I am. Here's my life. Here's my opportunity. God, use me. And some of you this morning, that might just be done in a silent prayer as we get ready to sing here in a second. Some of you might be coming to this altar and just pledging to the Lord, God, use my life, use my gifts, use my talent, use my time, use my resources. God, use me for your purpose. I, I don't know what the case is. If you need your pastor to pray over you, man, come grab Jonathan by the hand. He would love to pray over you. Pray over the call that, that God has set on your life. What, whatever it is, I just pray that you don't keep going like you're going right now, but you walk in what God has called you to right now. Let's pray. God, I thank you for each and every one of the people in this room, God. I thank you for, for the giftedness that you have given them for moment one in their life. God, I thank you that, that there are no accidents in this room. God, that there are simply image bearers made in your image to carry your glory and your message in all the world. God, from both Kinley to Kenya, God, I pray that, that this morning we would simply put our yes on the table before you. God, use me. God, use my circumstances. God, use my hardships. Use my joys. Use all that I am to show the world all that you are. God, just help us to see every opportunity you give us and God, to make the most of them, to show the world more of you. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
just pray with me, church? Father, we just are humbled to be in your presence today, Lord. Thank you for the wonderful reminder, God, that Brother Daniel gave us this morning, Lord. God, that you made us, you formed us for a purpose. God, continue to help us to seek that out, to follow that, Lord, and to take advantage of those opportunities that you bring before us, Lord, to live out our life for you, God. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for bringing Daniel and Heather today, Lord. God, we thank you and we love you. It's in Christ's name. Amen, man. Thank you so much. I do encourage you um, to continue just to seek out what God is calling you to do in your life. What a fantastic message. Thank you so much, Brother Daniel, um, for what God has spoken to us through him today. Um, We're thankful that you're here. Um, Just a couple of reminders again. Um, make sure you remember about the quarterly business meeting this coming week. Um, if you um, um, are interested on Mother's Day this year, we will be celebrating and having a parent-child dedication. Uh, we already have three people signed up, three, three children to be dedicated. So if you are interested in that, please reach out to me, contact me. You can contact uh, Miss Sherry in the church office, but we would love to have you as a part of that service on Mother's Day. It's a special day. It's also a day where we want to have a, a special time of parent-child dedication. When I do parent uh, dedications, uh, I dedicate um, the, the child to the church, to the Lord, uh, but also have a charge to the parents and a charge to the church because it's our job as a church body to help in, in, in raising up those children uh, because it takes a village. Amen. Um, and I know I need your help with mine. Amen. Um, but we're, um, we're just so thankful for that and looking forward to that. But um, I mean, we're so looking forward to this day. I hope you enjoy Brother Daniel. I know many of you guys know him. Um, some of you asked, why are you here today? I'm like, because I'm not missing this. So I'm not missing Brother Daniel. I've been, I tried in Missouri. It's never worked out to have him out to our church in Missouri. And so him being so close, I, 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 knew, we, I, I, I knew that we had to have him. And it worked out that he could come today. And we're so thankful. So thank you for taking the time and bringing your family. Yes, thank you so much. Um, uh, had a, you've had such an influence on my life and Heather and, and, and Katie's life, and we're just so thankful for you guys. Please come and, and encourage them and just say hi to them, introduce yourself to him. And uh, I would encourage you, he won't say this, but I will, pick up a couple of his books online. They, they, they are his story and how God's working in him and through him, and they will, they will help you in, in your walk. I've read both of them, and I'm so thankful for both of them, and, and God's used them in my life. But um, let me close us out in prayer, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, again, we just come to you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the challenge this morning, God. Thank you for that challenge, God, of living our life for you, Lord. It just fits right into what we've been thinking about as a church and seeking to do as a church of being a church on mission, Lord. Father, thank you for being here today. Thank you for the opportunity just to come and worship you today, Lord. Be with us, guide us, and direct us as we leave. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church.